Good evening, Fellowship Covenant Church family. We are so grateful to have you, our family members, friends, and visitors joining us this Wednesday evening, June 23rd. Amen. Our first Wednesday of summer of 2021. Praise God. Summer is in front of us. Spring is behind us. Amen. And we're so grateful to God to have this opportunity in this season to share God's word together. Praise God. We are still joining you virtually in evenings on Wednesdays and on Sundays and soon by the grace of God and the continued working of his mercy toward us, we'll be able to gather it together again in person. And I can hardly wait to hear the voices, see the hands waving, questions and the joy of the Lord being shared from one heart to the other. But until then, we will continue to rejoice and give God thanks because he's worthy of our praise. So join me in prayer before we begin our lesson tonight. Just bow your heads with me now. Father, in Jesus' name, we are so grateful, Lord, for the opportunity, for the privilege that we have to share the word of God tonight. Thank you, Father, for giving us the precious, the powerful, oh God, the potent word of the Lord Jesus Christ, the words that were inspired by the Holy Spirit that were left and written for us to feast on, to grow, to develop, to know your will in every aspect of our lives. We pray tonight, Father, that your word would take free course. Your word would have priority. We'll lay aside every obstacle, every distraction, everything that would try, oh God, to steal this time away. We shut it down now in the name of Jesus. Give us an appetite. Give us a hearing ear. Give us a humble spirit. Give us, oh God, revelation by the Holy Spirit concerning the truth of your word tonight. And we thank you, Father, for this evening. We thank you for another Wednesday. We bless you for this house, this sanctuary, this building that you have made provision for us to gather together, oh God, and share your word from. Bless us now, I pray, Father. Meet us here tonight and give us your understanding, your wisdom, and your revelation concerning the word of God. And we thank you and we bless you now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're continuing in our studies in the book of Jonah. As we've been going about this entire year, we have been sharing the 12 prophets, the book of 12. We've come down to Jonah now. We've got a few left before the year closes, but we're so grateful. We're on lesson number three of Jonah. Amen. Last week we talked about Jonah prays and is rescued. And tonight we're going to really dig into Jonah fulfills his calling. This is going to be a very, very important lesson. So right now, get your notes out, get your Bibles ready, get your glasses, your pens, amen. If you need to, shut your cell phones off, cut off the TV, tell Junior or tell little baby Jojo to be quiet. We've got to hear the word of God. Let's take in what God has given us. Now, last week, we had an opportunity to to talk about Jonah had to go to school. But here's what we talked about. Let's read the scripture together in Jonah 2 and verse 7. It says, when my life was ebbing away, the Lord, I remembered, my prayer came to you in your holy temple. Those who pay regard to false gods forsake their covenant love. But I will voice, I, but I with a voice of praise will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I intend to fulfill, that salvation belongs to the Lord. Then the Lord spoke to the great fish. It vomited Jonah on dry land. Up until this time, we have been talking about how Jonah was just so rebellious and refused to obey God. He was absolutely adamant, I am not going to Nineveh. I'm going to Tarshish. Instead, I'm going to disobey God because I know that that's not the way things are supposed to go. God allowed Jonah to get on a ship headed to Spain. Let's say it was Spain he was headed to. And 
on that ship, the storms of the storm came, amen, the waves beat upon the ship, and they knew, and Jonah knew, he was the trouble on board. He was the iceberg on the ship that needed to be hurled over for the ship and the sailors to survive. So at his request, amen, and the revelation of God to the sailors, they threw him overboard, and God allowed, God allowed a great fish a fish to come and rescue Jonah. Now, in the belly of the fish, what God did was he set up school. And we called our concept, our theme last week, that Jonah goes to school. The belly of the fish was a school for Jonah. So God used the tribulation, God used the affliction, God used the storm to teach Jonah a vital life lesson that he needed to learn. Now, before the storm, Jonah, before the, the lesson in class, Jonah had this paradigm. Jonah believed in his heart. He believed that I am the center of the universe. And he believed that because he knew God, he could go to God and let God know what he wanted and that everything from there would go his way. He says to God, I have an agenda I have a way in which I think the world ought to go, and I'm assigning my request to you. Now, let's pause for a second. Let's pause for a second because let's not throw Jonah under the bus here. What Jonah did is what I will argue many of us have done. We figure if I keep on praying, if I keep on obeying what I know to obey, Therefore, now I can present my agenda to God, give him his job description, and say, Lord, God, now this is what you got to do. Amen. I've earned this. This is what I want. This is how I want things to go. I want to, what are some of the things? I want a job that pays six figures. I want a husband that has big, gigantic muscles. I want a wife who earns more money than I do. I want a house on, 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 on Primrose Street. I want a car with a, with a mod modest monthly payment. I want all my kids to have a good job, all my grandkids to be A students. And if this don't happen, Lord, I have a cause to be alarmed that you have not followed my agenda. So what we do is we make the God of the universe, the God of all creation, we make God our assistant. That's what Jonah had done. Because see, what Jonah had messed up on is this. He failed, his system was this. You see, Jonah had a different solar system. You see, Jonah was the sun. You see, now in the solar system, all the planets revolve around the sun. All the planets get their heat from the sun. All the planets get their light from the sun. Without the sun, the planets that are farthest away are cold and dark. So the closest you are to the sun, you get the radiant, the heat, the energy, the light from the sun. But see, God designed the solar system. But what we do is we go in and we replace the solar system Instead of God being the sun, being the, 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 the planet where everything gets its light and nourishment from, we put ourselves in that place. See what Jonah did? Jonah is the big planet, and God is to get his rays and his heat and his direction from Jonah. Now, you say that's far-fetched. That's not far-fetched because many of us have replaced God at the center. And we expect God to revolve around us. You have no idea, and neither do I, how many folk have quit the kingdom of God, have resigned from following God because he didn't do what we wanted him to do, and we can't seem to figure out why he wouldn't have done it. All of the system said do it. The logic made sense to do it. Anything else would have been irrational or, or, or made no sense, but that's what Jonah was doing. It makes no sense to go to Nineveh. It's ridiculous. It's irrational. It's ignorant. Syria, Assyria, Nineveh, those people are our arch enemies. Why would I go to them and give them the gospel? 
Give them the good news. Let them know that God's angry with them. Because if God knows and they repent, God might say, spare them. We don't want our enemies to be spared. That's called telling God how he ought to be operating. And when he doesn't operate the way we want him to operate, what do we do? We go on a ship and we go to Spain. Okay, we abandoned God because God didn't fulfill what we expected him to do. All right, let's go quickly now. So here's how it comes to pass. That's what took place. Okay, so now we're going to look at, finally, last week, when Jonah got thrown overboard for being rebellious and disobedient, God sent a rescue squad, took him to school. Jonah became a student. God allowed the, sh the fish to throw Jonah on dry land, and now we see what takes place. Let's look at what happens now. We're going to read now out of the book of Jonah, chapter number three, the entire chapter. So read with me as we go. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Up, go to the great city of Nineveh. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I am about to speak to you. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now, Nineveh was an extremely great city, a three-day journey. Jonah began to enter one day's walk into the city, and he proclaimed, Yet forty days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God and proclaimed a fast. And all from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. The message reached the king of Nineveh, and he rose from his throne, took off his royal cloak, put on sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he had a proclamation made and published in Nineveh by order of the king and his nobles, let not man nor beast Herd nor flock, taste anything, let them not pasture nor drink water. And let both man and beast put on sackcloth and call insistently to God. And let each man turn from his evil way and from the violence of his hands. Who knows? God may turn about and be moved to pity, and turn from the heat of his anger so that we do not perish. And God saw their deeds, that they had turned from their evil ways. So God repented of the evil that he had intended to do to them, and he did not do it. But Jonah was deeply offended, chapter 4, deeply offended and furious. And he prayed to the Lord and said, I pray you, O Lord, is this not what I said would happen while I was still in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from pursuing calamity. So now, O oh Lord, take away my life from me, for to me, death is preferable to life. And the Lord said, Are you right to be angry? We're going to talk the theme tonight's going to be Jonah is awakened partially. All right, let's say it. Our theme tonight is Jonah is awakened partially. Let's look at the old Jonah for a moment. Now, the old Jonah received the word in the first chapter of the book of Jonah, chapter 1, verse 2. The word came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, and up to the great city of Nineveh. Go up. Jonah got up to run toward, away toward Tarshish 
from the Lord's presence. That's the old Jonah before he went to school. Now let's take a look at the new Jonah. But before we get to the new Jonah, I have a question for you. I have a question. Now, if you were in charge and if you had saved Jonah, but nevertheless disqualified him from ever being a prophet again, who could blame you for this decision? That's on your screens. Here's what I'm saying. God rescues Jonah from the, from the, the ocean, from open, being thrown overboard. He's rescued. God appointed a fish to come and rescue Jonah, took Jonah to school, Jonah cries out for mercy, God forgives him, and then God instructs the fish, instructs the fish, throw him on dry land. Now, how many of us would honestly say in our hearts, if you were in charge and Jonah was your subject, Jonah was your employee, Jonah was what you created, and you had to go through all of this stuff, he's pouting, he's complaining, he's murmuring, he's gossiping, he's sleeping, and know what else he does? He refuses to pray until he can't see his way out of a dark fish. That's when he prays. But God, who was relentless in mercy and graciousness, rescues Jonah, puts him in the fish, teaches him in school, he becomes a student, he redeems Jonah, lets him go on dry land. Now, how many of us would then tap Jonah in the shoulder and say, Jonah, go home, or say, Jonah, come, I've got work for you to do now. Now, I gotta tell you, I have to tell you, honestly, honestly, I have been in situations where I have people I've had to educate on how things ought to be done, after I educated them, I was just about saying in my heart, now I am through with you. Go on and do what you got to do. I did all I can do. I can't trust you anymore. I can't put any confidence in you. But here's what happens. Here's what happens. Look at the next verse. Now, Jonah, the awakened Jonah, it says the word of the Lord came to Jonah and look what it says, a second time. The same thing he said the first time, now he says the second time. He says what? Up, go to the great city of Nineveh. So Jonah got up and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Can you believe that? That after all that rebellion, all of that rebelling, all of that kicking and screaming, the message didn't change. God is still God. He does not need Jonah. Jonah still doesn't understand the magnitude of what he has probably done, but he had enough sense to cry out for God. But this time, the awakened, partially awakened Jonah gets up and he goes. Now, here's the deal. The odds of him surviving this are still slim. Get on the next verse. Jeremiah, Jeremiah, a similar prophet, one of Jonah's contemporaries, went into the city. Here's what it says. But as soon as Jeremiah finished telling all the people everything the Lord had commanded him to say, look at what happens. The priests and the prophets and all the people seized him and said, you must die. Listen, it's real life. The people during that time did not want to hear from God. Jonah knows that. Jeremiah experienced that. Jonah would rather fight than go, but God redeems him, rescues him from the wrath of the storm. And then what does God do? God appears to Jonah the second time. My God, how many have ever felt you failed so much God is through with you? Well, this message tonight comes to remind you, remind me, remind us that God is not through with us. If there's breath in your lungs, if you're able to move and breathe tonight, that is message enough to know that God 
is not through with you yet. My God, if you're breathing, if you're functioning, I don't care how rebellious you are, the doors are still open, the altar is still crying, come to me. I've got a place for you. My God, my God, what kind of God is this? Now, so Jonah goes to town, and it says he began to enter the town. Now, that's a pivotal word. That means this. When you see the word began to enter, underline that word in your Bibles. Underline that in your notes. Began to enter. That's defined as this. Jonah began to let loose, untie, to release himself from the reservations about the mission. You see, Jonah had to release the, 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 the results of the mission to God. You see, he was so tied up that he makes a partial release now of the consequences of what can happen. You see, Jonah, we said earlier in lesson number two, Jonah was so absorbed with the outcome. All God tells us to do is focus on the task. Let me take care of the outcome. You see, we have somehow elevated ourselves up to job to God's grade level. You follow? It's, a, it's above my pay grade to start con be concerned about outcomes. My job is the task, the responsibility that God gave me. The outcome is his job. It's not my job. I'm, I, I'm not, I, that's not my pay grade. I'm outside of, I'm, that, oh, that's called in the corporate world, that's called roll creep. Roll creep. You know what roll creep is? That's when you got a job, here's the lane you drive in, but all of a sudden I find you over in this lane. And I'm walking up and saying, yo, bro, listen, your job is at this desk. Her job is at this desk. You stay in your lane, let her stay in your hair, her lane, and all together we'll get the job done. It's our responsibility, people of God, not to worry about the outcome. Just follow the task. Just do what God tells us to do, and he will take care of the outcome. Jonah had to partially release himself and his reservations about the outcome and let God do what he was going to do. So, here's the big message. It took him weeks to finally proclaim. In the Hebrew, this is five words. In, the, in, in, in English, it's eight words. At the end of the day, all he had to do was go to Nineveh and say this. In 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. That's a simple message. Listen, that's like, you know, back in the day you were in Sunday school, Easter pageant, the little kids had one line, and they got up and they said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And then we all clapped, and that was all he had to say. Got a whole big bag of jelly beans, a couple of eggs, and a, and a, and a, and a, and a, a chocolate bunny, and that was all he had to do. All Jonah had to do was be obedient to these eight words and proclaim, yet, 40 days in Nineveh, and you will be overthrown. That's what the narrator tells us. Because here, here's where it got hickly pickly, all right? The word overthrown to us, we look at the center in the Hebrew, it's the word hapak, all right? And it says to turn, overturn, or to overthrow. But here's the deal. The word means more than that in the Hebrew. You see, and that's what got Jonah upset because the word overthrow in the Hebrew has four or five different meanings. You see, it could also mean overthrow could mean overwhelm. It could also mean turn around. It could mean overthrow. It could mean turn. But you know what it means in the white box right there? It means this also. The word could also mean to change. Uh-oh. To transform. The nature of something. Oh, God. Now, listen, Jonah is no ignorant person. Jonah knows that when God says the message is this, go to Nineveh and tell them I will overthrow the city, he also knows that word overthrow could potentially mean I will change the city, I will transform the city, I will transform and change the nature of the city and what Jonah doesn't want. 
He does not want the city to be transformed and its nature changed. He wants the city to be eradicated, overthrown, turned over, done with. But he realizes for one moment he can't control the outcome. He has a task to do. He proclaims it. He knows it could mean transformation. And if it's a transformation, it means this. Something that was like this could now be transformed into something like this. That's the power of God. Jonah knows that. So he has to go. But see, the message for Jonah, in essence, for this nation, it was about social reform. The imperative was for them to stop the evil, violent behavior that was taking place toward each other. Listen, Jonah does not go to Nineveh and tell the Ninevites, it's time for you to start worshiping Yahweh. He doesn't go to Nineveh and say to the Ninevites, it's time for you to start making sacrifices. He doesn't go to Nineveh and tell the Ninevites, it's time for you to be circumcised. No, what, 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 what the calamity the evil that came in God's nostrils was around the social condition of the nation. God was tired of seeing people denied social rights. Why are you so adamant about that, Elder? Because I want to whisper to every ear that's hearing me tonight, God is sick and tired, even in a heathen nation. It doesn't call itself one nation under God in the visible. No, God is sick and tired of any nation of people who treat any class of people less than they are. You think God is laughing when Congress and the senators filibuster around voting suppression? You think God is laughing when people want to deny health care to folk who need it? You think God is laughing when folk living in housing projects can't get heat, can't get hot water, can't get living conditions that are decent? And God says, oh, that's so funny. I'm happy they're having a good time. No, God is saying, I am. I'm going to show you my wrath. And that's what was upsetting God about Nineveh. Listen, Jonah didn't go in with the Yahweh message. Give your life to Yahweh. No, he went in saying, your violent behavior, treating other people. How do you know that? Look at what it says. Listen, look at what he says in verse 8. He says, let humans and animals alike put on mourning clothes and let them call upon God. What does he say? And let all persons stop their evil behavior and the violence that is under their control. Listen, this wasn't even about war atrocities. This was about you and I walking together and not trying to kill each other. This is about the violence that we see happening in our streets with police brutality, but not just police brutality, but human brutality. This one beating up this one, this one mugging this one, Asian hate, black hate, white hate. God is sick of it. And he tells the Ninevites, this has got to stop. If it doesn't stop, if it doesn't stop, I'm going to bring calamity upon you. And that's the wrath of God. You see, we think sometimes it's just about idolatry and serving other gods, but God is looking at the way we treat each other. He is looking at the way we treat each other. And he was looking at the way the Ninevites were treating each other. The sins of Nineveh were all about social issues. That was the sin of Nineveh, social issues. Listen, listen, look at what it says in Isaiah 9 and 19. I'll read this briefly. The land was scorched by the rage of the Lord of heavenly forces. The people were like fuel for the fire. Not one person pitied another. Do you hear what Isaiah says? Not one person pitied another. They consumed on the right, right, but remained hungry devoured on the left, and were not satisfied. 
They devour the flesh of their own children. This is what, listen, listen, listen to me, please. America, countries across this world, whether you worship God or not, God is not pleased with the devouring, with the hatred, with the scorching that we do with each other. Listen, and let me just put this out to the church of Jesus Christ tonight, to the body of Christ. Judgment will begin in the house of God. It begins with us. He gave us two things. He said, love me with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do you know what he said after that? He said, love your neighbor as yourself. We are being evaluated by how we treat each other. And God was angry with the Ninevites. He's angry in the 21st century, 2021, with some of the harsh treatments that people have to go through. We devour and we're still hungry. No one pities the other. It's all about me. We're opera singers. We're all, many of us have turned into opera singers. You know what an opera singer is? It's the one who sings all the time. Me, 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 me. It's all about what? Me. It's about me. Jesus says, I behoove you, pick up your cross, deny yourself, and follow me. That's the word of God. That's the word of God. All through the nations, we studied this in Amos real quick, remember? Amos, all the judgments that came upon these nations, here they are. All of these are social issues. Damascus, Gaza, Tyre, Edom, all of these countries, Amman, Moab, all of them what? Atrocities, the next slide, a crimes toward people. Crimes of what? Slave trading. Crimes of covenant breaking. Ongoing wrath. Atrocities of helplessness. Atrocities toward the dead. Those were the things that Nineveh was in for. They needed to stop the way they were treating each other. That's why the king said, whatever is in our hands to do, treat each other the right way. That was the issue. Look at this. It's calamity, it says in verse 1 in our next slide, calamity has come to my notice. Let each person, look at what it says, turn from his evil way and from the violence, what? In your hands. What you and I have responsibility to do and we are accountable to God, how do we treat each other? That's what he's asking them to do. Deal with that. Now, why do people repent? Because something amazing happened here. Jonah goes and he preaches this message. It's eight words, all right? God's giving you 40 days to think about what you're doing. The 40 days always symbolizes a time of reflection, a time of deep pondering. And in that time, they had to think about what they were doing and make a decision. Are you going to change? Are you going to continue to live like this? If you do, there's a consequence. If you don't change, there is a consequence. They had to deal with it, all right? So here's what we got. Repentance in the Hebrew is a word, and it means to turn, shub, to turn. What does he have to do? Turn from evil ways, from the violence in your hands. And that was the call of Jonah. Turn from your evil ways, Ninevites. Turn from treating people the way you treat them. Turn from denying health care costs, health care benefits of those that are in need. Turn from denying people access to food at a reasonable price. Turn from going into and gentrifying neighborhoods and putting the poor outside so the rich can get richer. Turn from these things. If you don't turn from them, you will experience my wrath. That's what he told them to do. That was the word of God. And what happened here was amazing. They were called to repent. But here's what he says in the fifth verse. He says what? The Ninevites believed God. And what did they do? The Ninevites proclaimed the fast. The Ninevites and all from the greatest to the least, the middle class, the upper class, the lower class, the servants, and the masters, everybody said, we are wrong. We've got to change. We've got to turn from our wicked ways. 
And notice it says this, the Ninevites, who are the Ninevites? The common everyday citizens, you and me, not the big muckety mucks, not the president, not the senators. It began at a ground level. Revival begins at a ground level. And that's what happened at the ground level. The people got together and said, we've got to mobilize and change. And what did they do? They proclaimed the fast, a fast in contrast to a feast. And also their normal clothes that are dressed in beautiful array and attire to sackcloth. Sackcloth is mourning attire. It's the, it's the fabric of goat's hair. To put it on your skin is irritable. And it's always black and dull. It's not noticeable. But they said, take off your beautiful clothes and put on sackcloth. And let's stop feasting. And let's go without eating. Let's fast. Who fasts? Who puts on a sackcloth? The word of God says what? Everybody. No exemptions. Republicans and Democrats, blacks and whites, Asians and Puerto Ricans, rich and poor, male and female, everybody, the Ninevites, believed God. What does that word believe means? They believe, the word believe there means they trust that what God was saying to the prophet, if they changed, things could get better. They mobilized. They got together. They made a decision. Now, keep this in mind. Whenever repentance takes place, it is always a work of God. Paul said in Timothy, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God, pre-adventure, will give them what? Repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Listen, that's a hopeful text. You know what that says? If you've got a son or a daughter, a husband or a wife, a brother or a sister who refuses to repent, you can pray. And God can pre-adventure give them a spirit to repent. God can influence the heart leading it to repentance. And that's what he did. Now here's what's so beautiful about this. First Jonah goes into a one day's journey right into the hearts of the, hearts of the area. But then the message from the suburbs reaches the king, the palace. Because here's what it says. The message reached the king of Nineveh. It didn't say that Jonah went to the king. It said the message reached the king. Which means that like fire burning across the cities, it got to the top echelon of people. And when he heard about it, look at what he does. This is a beautiful picture. The king got the message. The king of Nineveh got the message. And look at what he does. The king got the message and it says what? He does three things. He rose from his throne. That's the first thing. He got up. He got up. He got up. Sometimes when you get a message that's powerful, that's riveting, that's convicting, you have got to get up. Listen, oh, elder, you step on my feet, then move them. My feet are burning. Then take off the shoes and move your feet. You've got, we've got to get up. We can't just sit back. Oh, that's the way it's going to be. No, move. The king got up and moved. After he got up and moved, look what he said he did. Step two, he took off his robe. You know what that says? He humbled himself. He became like everybody else. He didn't say, well, you know, I've been going to church for 45 years, and my mama helped build this church. My daddy laid the first brick, and I'm the descendants of the forefathers. Of great. No, listen, he got up from the royal throne, took off his robe. I'm done with this. No more deity, no more dignity now. No more deity, no more of the royalty. I don't need that now. We've got to descend from our high places and come down. Step three. He clothed himself in sackcloth. He put on uncomfortable undergarments. He put on irritable fabrics on his body in black from the beautiful purple that he wore in his royal clothes. Now he goes into black sackcloth. But that wasn't enough. After he did that, 
He sat down in dust, ashes, dust, filth. He sat down in the dust and he fasted, he prayed, he cried out to God, but he had something so powerful to say. Look at the new king's posture. He's not on the throne anymore. The king has descended. He's on ashes. He's in sackcloth. He's humbling himself. That's why the word of God tells us, if my people humble themselves and seek my face, then will I hear their prayer. I'll forgive their sin. And here's what he does. He then makes a proclamation. He uses his power to change things. He made a, and he published it in Nineveh by order of the king and his nobles. Here's what he says. He's clear. He says, I want everybody who knows, he's, who knows God may turn about and be moved to pity and turn from the heat of his anger so that we do not perish. So he's calling everybody to pray that God would have mercy. And look at what happens in verse 10. This is our God. These are Gentiles. These are not covenant people. These are not people of Abraham's descent. These are pagan worshipers who call on God. And the word of God says this, and God saw their deeds. They had what? Repented. That word turn means repented from the evil ways. So what did God do? God turned of the evil he had intended to do to them, and he did not do it. So think about this now, people of God. Let's pause for a second. Jonah finally goes to Nineveh. The second time, Jonah goes to Nineveh. Jonah is awakened. Jonah gets up. Jonah goes to Nineveh. The city repents. Now, keep in mind, the city did not turn to Yahwehism. The city did not begin to circumcise their people or offer sacrifices. They still had multiple gods, but they knew the one God who could spare them was a God that Jonah talked about, and they cried out to that God for mercy, and God gave them mercy. God forgave them. God healed them. God let them off of what was going to happen. Now, think about this for a second. We said Jonah was awakened, right? Reawakened. Jonah was in the belly of the fish. He was dead. And then now something miraculous happens to Jonah. He goes out and delivers this message. And this message transforms an entire city of people in Nineveh. And they all turn and God has mercy. But look at what happens now. We're going to just pick apart this for the next five minutes, and we're going to call it a night. We're going to come back to chapter 4 next week, but look at what happens. Now, you would think, but Jonah, look at, let's read verse 1 and 2. But Jonah was deeply, what, offended and furious, and he prayed to the Lord and said, I pray you, O Lord, is this not what I said would happen? Well, I was still in my country. Now, hold that for a second. Jonah just has gone through getting the word of God the first time, going on a ship to Spain to rebel against and disobey God, hurled overboard into a tumultuous, violent sea where God appoints a fish to rescue him, God schools him in the belly of the fish. After he's schooled and educated, he cries out for mercy. God allows the fish to vomit him on dry land. Then, instead of being through with him, then God calls him again the second time and says, Jonah, here's a message. You'll get it when you get to Nineveh. Go to Nineveh. Jonah gets up. He goes. He preaches to the city of Nineveh. God turns their heart to repentance. They all repent. Now, Jonah doesn't leave the city. He goes in the outskirts of the city. He's looking in at the city that's now repenting and crying out to God, and God's having mercy on them. And look at what happens to Jonah. Jonah is what? Deeply offended. Jonah is angry with God. 
because he said, Lord, this is what I said would happen. If I go, you will not do what I assigned you to do. You're off script now, God. You let this nation that's been pulverizing Israel, and I'm an Israelite, I'm a patriotic Israelite, you let those people survive. Look at what this is in the next two verses. That is why I made haste. He's saying to God, this is why I made haste to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from what? Calamity. Ready to relent from calamity. You're ready to relent from sending calamity. Listen, listen to what, hold on a second. Everybody, pause for a second now. All right, let's pause. We're doing well on time. I'll let you go in a minute, okay? You can, matter of fact, you can cut the oven on, get the food warmed up. All right, we're going to be done in, in, in less than 10 minutes. Jonah preaches a message. God hears the people's prayer. Jonah is now angry with God for letting the people survive and relenting from sending calamity. And no, did you pick up the middle part of that verse? Look at what it says. That is why I made haste to not go in the first place. What has Jonah said? Jonah does what many of us do. You know what Jonah does? Jonah now hits God with his own words. You see that? You see, see Jonah, he's so low. He hits God with his own words. Not, not Jonah's words. He hits God with his words, the word of God. Where do you see that, Elder? Look at what he says there. For I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. You know what that is? That's out of Exodus. That's out of the Torah. Out of Exodus 34th chapter, God reveals himself to Moses saying, Moses, this is who I am. I'm a merciful God. I'm slow to anger, steadfast love. I'm ready to forgive, abounding in mercy and faithfulness. Jonah now, to defend his anger, he now hits God with his own, with God's word. In other words, that's like we do. Well, Lord, uh, I prayed for a husband. I prayed for a wife. And I get married before I turn 32. And here it is, I'm not married. Didn't you say, ask and it shall be given? Didn't you say, knock and the door shall be opened? Didn't you say, seek and ye shall find? Didn't you say, anything you ask in my name, I'll do it? That's what Jonah does. Jonah is so angry, he fails to understand one thing, that God is not dictated by what Jonah thinks or what we think, or how we feel, that God is dealing with eternity. He's got a plan that would blow our minds. And it's our job to distrust him, to trust that he knows what he's doing. But know what else Jonah tells us? We said Jonah was partially awakened. God says, so now, O oh Lord, take away my life. Here's what Jonah reveals to us. This is why I said earlier, Jonah is partially awakened. Awakened partially. You know why? Because he reveals something to all of us right now that we need to understand. It's our last part in the last couple of minutes. So now, O oh Lord, take away my life from me. For to me, death is what? Preferable to life. Jonah says, Lord, I'd rather die now than live with the way things are. And the Lord said, are you right to be angry? Listen to this, people of God. What does Jonah reveal to us in that statement? Jonah says to God, and this is amazing, and it speaks to my heart, so I'm going to be transparent with you. Jonah says to God, I'd rather have death than life than to live knowing 
that the Ninevites were spared. That's not just what he's saying, no. What he's saying this, I'd rather be dead than to live and know that Israel is still vulnerable to the Assyrians. Because I'm a patriot, and what's important to me more than even life is that the Israelites are secure and safe from their enemies. So what does John reveal to us? Why do you say he's awakened partially? Because of this. What is an idol? How do you define an idol? How do you define anything that you put in front of God? Here's what an idol is. An idol is anything in your life other than Jesus that doing without would make life not worth living. Write that down. Write it down. Write it down tonight. It's your last note. Hey, Amen. We got five minutes to go. Write it down. What is an idol, Elder? You mean to tell me my little cross in the living room, my little picture with, 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 with JFK, MLK, and RFK, I took that down. I still got idols? You mean the fan with MLK on the fan? That's, I threw that out my window. I still got idols? You mean to tell me when I walk by the church, the whole button, I still got idols? I stopped holding buttons. You mean to tell me I still got idol? You ask yourself the question tonight. You ponder in the next couple of minutes. Ask yourself this question. Is there anything in your life? Anything? A son, a daughter, an affirmation, an approval, a job, a vision, a dream, a car, a hope, anything? Is there anything in your life other than Jesus? that doing without would make life not worth living. In other words, you say, if I don't have this, Lord, I'm good as dead. If I don't get the affirmation of this, I'm good as dead. If, I don't, if this person's not my friend anymore, Lord, I'm good as dead. If this person goes to glory tomorrow, Lord, I'm as good as dead. If there is anything in our life, that we, not having any longer, would make life not worth living. Wake up tonight on the 23rd of June, this Wednesday, the first Wednesday of summer 2021, you've got an idol. And you know what Jesus said, the word of God says? You shall have no other God before me. You will love me with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength. As innocent as it might seem, if you make this statement today, take away my life from me because I don't have this connection anymore, this relationship anymore, this job anymore, this status anymore, this social status anymore, this society ranking anymore, I can't live in this neighborhood anymore, I can't drive this car anymore, I'm not known as this anymore, I've lost my lust, I've lost my move, I don't have this anymore. I would rather die if there's anything in your life, people of God, this Wednesday night, listen to me. I'm preaching to myself as well. Anything in our lives that we prefer to die and to do without is the biblical definition of an idol. And it's our job to be awakened, to be awakened and to see, Lord, take my idols down. I want to be done with this. I want you everything. Listen, Jesus will never be all you need until he is everything you have. He's got to be everything. Now listen, I'm not, I'm not saying it's wrong to have good relationships, a good marriage, a good job, a good home, a good family, good grandkids. Yes, 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 yes. I want them all. My God. Absolutely. Amen. Paul says to enjoy life and live abundantly. It's, it's a great thing. But listen to what I'm saying to you. If those things cloud your heart, 
and dilute your loyalty to God, then they've taken over. They become inordinate affections. They become unbridled lusts because you're saying, I've got to have this more than God. And when that comes into this focus, then God says, listen, brothers and sisters, you know what God says? God has a do not compete clause. He will not compete with you and your idols. You want those things? You want to put those before me? You're going right ahead. See how far they'll get you. I will not compete for your affection. I'll love you. I'll love you when you wake up and come back. I'll be here. But listen, you've got to see and pray your eyes are open to realize, Lord, I want you and you only more than anything, more than your money, more than your money, more than your money. And you know what it's time to do now? It's offering time. Time to get your gadgets out. Amen. Send your gifts forward. Now, if you feel that that dollar in your pocket is more important to you than obeying God's word, I ask you to examine yourself the question. Have you made money? Mammoth, filthy lucre, your God. Jonah. Jonah esteemed his patriotism. He's so patriotic to Israel. He'd rather have Israel secure than to have God's will done. That was behind his run to Spain. God bless you. We thank you for your gifts tonight. Those of you who know our mechanisms, you can send it to fellowshipcovenantamen.com. You can mail it to 720 Castle Avenue. You can also bless us by going on to Zelly or PayPal or Cash App. There are a myriad of different ways. You know the drill, but no one thing, whatever you give, amen, we appreciate it. We give God glory for it, and we just thank you for your generosity and your continued support. Bless God. We'll wrap up the book of Jonah next week. Praise God. We'll be done. Amen. With Jonah's final, we'll see why Jonah was partially awakened. We saw it now. He still didn't see the idol. Let's examine Jonah next. We're going to do two things next Wednesday. We're going to wrap up Jonah, and we're going to introduce Micah, the next prophet that's right behind Jonah that we'll be exploring for the month of July. I love you, fellowship family. Know one thing, that I am absolutely honored and I am privileged to share God's word with you. And I'm honored to share, amen, whatever God reveals to me with you. And I love to hear what he reveals to you. Share it with me. I love to receive it. I love God's word. I love you. I appreciate this opportunity to share God's word with you tonight. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we bless you tonight for the word of God has come forth. We pray you'd continue to open up our eyes. Continue to help us reflect and ponder and consider all your wonderful mercies and grace. Father, we pray tonight for your continued edifying of the word of God in our lives. Keep us, we pray tonight, Father. Let your word take root in our lives. Bless, I pray, all the hearers. Even bless those who gave tonight, those who transmitted income and, and cost to us, Lord. We thank you for that. Bless them, Father, we pray. Continue to meet our needs and meet their needs as well. And we give you the glory tonight for our media team and all the hands that make this transmission possible. We give you the glory for it, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now unto him, he'll keep us from falling. Until we meet again, I love you. We appreciate you. Looking forward to seeing you on Sunday morning. Praise God for our worship at 10 o'clock. Until then, God be with you and the peace of Christ be yours. God bless you.